Well, hey everyone, welcome to Grace Life. Would you help me welcome all of our first time guests, those of you here in the room as well as online. So glad to have you worshiping with us today. And uh, if you are a guest, what we're doing today is we are finishing up a series that we've been doing now for a while called The Church Jesus is Building. It's actually taken us eight weeks to get to this point. This is the eighth part of the series. Uh, The good news, for those of you that wandered away for a weekend to see the beautiful leaves in the mountains, or if you had to sleep in on a Sunday after one of those Gamecock tough losses and you couldn't face the world, or if you're a guest and you've missed part of the series, it's all online or on our app. Um, So anyway, look, here's the idea behind the series. Jesus told his disciples, I will build my church. I will build my church. And so the question we have to ask ourselves 2,000 years later, are we being the church Jesus intended for us to be? And so the best picture that we can get is what we see in the book of Acts, right? Jesus was crucified. He was raised from the dead. And then he actually spent 40 days on the earth with his closest disciples teaching them about the kingdom of God, which would obviously include how to be this church that he intends to build. Then he ascended to heaven and sent his disciples to go and be that church. The opening chapters of Acts gives us a a pretty beautiful picture of what that looks like. And so we've been just studying these opening chapters, just the first six chapters of Acts for this series. But I want to make sure you haven't missed the point. I have not been preaching uh, this series to give you an idyllic or beautiful picture of the church 2,000 years ago and to say, wasn't that amazing? The whole point of this series is for you and me each week to look in the mirror and say, is that going on in my life? And so since it is the last part of the series, I always like to do a little bit of review, make sure we're on the same page. And so I'm going to give you a, a one sentence review of each part. And as we do this, as we're going through it, Let's just ask ourselves, are we living this out today? Is that okay with everybody? So we started out part one, and we saw when Jesus told his, I can speak, when Jesus told his disciples, wait, wait, don't go anywhere yet, don't leave yet, you need the Holy Spirit. Wait for the Holy Spirit so that you have power to be my witnesses. The bottom line, even Jesus understood, is just walking upon the earth with a story about a dead man that's now alive, the story won't be enough. You're gonna need the Spirit of God living inside of you. You're gonna need the Spirit of God leading you to particular opportunities. Talk to this person now, pray for that person now, and that he would put power in us through the Holy Spirit. Part two, we saw when the Holy Spirit was poured out, right? Jesus said, wait. And then in part two, we saw the Holy Spirit come upon the community of believers. And look, if you've never read that before, if it was the first time you came across that story in Acts chapter two, uh, without a doubt, that was one of the most bizarre events in all of the Bible. Little tongues of fire on people's heads, people speaking weird languages, everybody thinks the believers are drunk. I mean, come on, y'all, that was just a weird, weird event. And if you want to just say, you know, I don't want anything to do with that particular thing, I just want to remind you, it was God's idea. It was God's idea. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we believe God is still moving supernaturally and powerfully upon the earth? Does God still empower believers to do things in this world that will change other people's lives? And then we got to part three, and and we saw this beautiful picture again of of how the early disciples and the people who were new to the church, how they did church life. Those two words, church life. You know you have a work life, you have a family life, you have a hobby life. You should also have a church life, and you do. The question is, what does it look like? You see, for them 2,000 years ago, those who had been close to Jesus and with Jesus, they had devoted themselves to five things. As a community, there were five things they were devoted to. And so it's up to each one of us to look in the mirror and say, am I devoted to the same things that those disciples of Jesus were? In part four, we learned that people have been putting labels and expectations on those who follow Jesus for over 2,000 years. And we cannot meet all of their expectations. But there are things we can do. And the question that we had to answer that day was, are we giving what we do have to give to this broken and hurting world? In part five, we were challenged to be bold for the name of Jesus in light of persecution. You know, we face a little something lately uh, called cancel culture, and we think, oh, well, that just means I need to be careful about what I put on social media. No, it's nothing new. And actually, for 2,000 years, people who represent the name of Jesus have been getting canceled and being persecuted and being oppressed and discriminated against. So the question for you and me today is, are we willing to be bold for the name of Jesus? Even if it cost you a promotion or if it cost you a fake friend that you thought was a real friend when they abandon you because you're willing to be bold. 
And then in part six, we learned about how every one of us has a part to play. You are not here to watch me. You're not here to just look at somebody on stage sing. You are a part of the church Jesus is building. You have gifts that God has put in you. You have a calling on your life. You have something to do that will change this world. And we're gonna draw a little line after those first six parts because the last two are different. The one that I preached last week and the one I'm gonna preach this week are both really warnings. They're warnings to you and me. And you may say, Jimmy, that doesn't sound like fun to end the series on a warning. Why would we do that? Well, because there's a truth that we can't ignore and I think we need to keep it in front of us right as we wrap up this series and that is the church Jesus is building will always be the church Satan is attacking. Was 2,000 years ago and it still is today. The church Jesus is building will always be the church Satan is attacking. And the reason that the church that we see 2,000 years ago, that beautiful picture, and it seems like everything was just ideal. The reason we know it could not have stayed that way, very simple, one fact you can't get around. It was filled with people. I'm glad some of the people understood that that was meant to be a little funny. But the church then was filled with people. And well, people, we have some issues, right? Matter of fact, has anyone in here ever had a bad experience in church? Maybe you got a little church hurt. Somebody got a little church hurt in them. You know what I'm talking about? What comes to mind? The person who did it. Because what that means is that at some point, a person in church somewhere at some point didn't act like Jesus. They didn't treat you exactly like Jesus would have treated you. And so the reality we have to face is Jesus is perfect. His people are not. We're working on it. We hope to get better every day, but we're not perfect. And so in part seven, we talked about one of the problems that comes with imperfect humans, and that is how they start pointing fingers at each other, blaming each other, accusing each other, and we saw division come into the church. Just remember, a divided church is the devil's playground. So today, though, I'm going to end the series with the other thing that we see happening in the book of Acts, and in my personal opinion... The reason I think this is so important, I think that what we're going to talk about today is the greatest threat in particular, or to be specific, I guess, the greatest threat specifically to how Satan would attack the church, the greatest threat to keeping us from being what Jesus intends, well, it's the sinfulness of humanity. If you've got a church filled with people, you're probably going to have a church filled with some sin. Now, here's the good news. If Jesus is your king, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you have a new nature, Raise your hand if Jesus is the Lord and Savior of your life, if you have met him personally and you know that he died for you. Okay, that means that you have a new nature. The problem is our new nature sometimes fights to be in charge with our old nature, our sin nature. And so that's what we see happening even in the book of Acts. That's where we're going to be today. And um, if you've got your Bibles, you can turn with me. We're going to be at the very end of chapter 4. We're going to start where we left off last week. We're going to read that beautiful summary of how great everything was, and then we're going to see it start to take a turn. So if you've got your Bibles, it is uh, chapter 4, verse 32. And again, we read this last week. It says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Man, that, that just sounds amazing, doesn't it? Jump to verse 34. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them. And they brought the proceeds of what was sold and they laid it at the apostles' feet and then it was distributed to any as they had need. Again, this is the summary, the final statement describing what we call the age of innocence of the church. But it doesn't take long, just a few sentences later. Read with me at the beginning of Acts chapter five. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and we just read what everybody did with the property they sold, except these two. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie? Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? On the surface, it looks like the issue is that they lied. Some of you have heard a sermon about this before, and it's all about lying. And some of us have taught our children this story. Do you want to be like Ananias? Don't lie to your daddy. You know, we've, we've kind of done that to our children, right? 
The problem is if that were the only issue or the key issue, I could just tell everybody, don't lie, especially in church, now go enjoy your lunch. And we'd be done. But I don't think that's the key issue. The key issue, Peter revealed, it's what was happening in his heart. Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie? There was something going on in his heart that became the root problem. But let's just keep going because we're going to talk about that in just a moment. It says, while it remained, Peter said to him, while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? You didn't even have to sell it. You could have kept it. And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? You could have done whatever you chose to do. It's important to understand, we talked about this in part two, but I want to reiterate this so that you understand what is taking place in the story. This is not the birth of socialism. They were free to do whatever they want with what they had. They were simply being generous to each other because of survival in the midst of persecution. They were being oppressed. They were losing jobs for the name of Jesus. And so in order for them to simply feed each other, uh, feed their families, they would have to give to each other to take care of each other. So it wasn't socialism where whatever they had was taken for the common good. It also wasn't communism or a dictatorship where it was taken by force. Peter is being very clear. This was for you to do whatever was in your heart with it. And that's why Peter asked, so why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. And when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard it. And the young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him without talking to anybody, without having a ceremony. They just dug a hole and put him in it. And actually, that says something. The reason that they had such a hasty burial and they didn't invite any family or have any ceremony to honor him is because they recognized that this was the judgment of God that had dropped him to the ground. And the judgment of God was one of the reasons that they would bury people in haste without any ceremony. Let's keep going, though. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. Remarkable. They didn't tell her. Why did they not tell her? Because of what he had done. And so Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said, how is it that you've agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. And immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And when the young men came in, they found her dead. And they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. As we were working on these notes this week, and I was sharing this with the staff, our executive pastor pointed out, he hasn't heard of anybody dying in church for lying to a pastor lately. So I pointed out to him, if that happens this weekend, you're on the hook for, like, <laughs> saying it should happen again. But anyway, but here's the deal. And great fear came upon the whole church. Great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. And there's something important that I want you to know right here, a little Bible nerd fact, if there's any Bible nerds in the room. This is the first time the word church is used to label the community. It's the first time. So far up until this point, they've been called the believers because they were believers that this Jesus guy was the risen Messiah. They were believers that Jesus was the Messiah. This is the first time that they are being called the church. Now, let me, let me share with you why that's so important. When we use the word church, we're talking about a building. And over and over here at Grace Life, we've kind of tried to remind you, this is not a church. This is a warehouse we tried to make pretty enough that you'll come inside of it. People are the church. And the Greek word that is used here for church is the reason we harp on this because it, it actually simply means the gathering of God's people. As a community of God's people, it's the gathering of God's people, as a community of God's people. So get this. Let me connect the dots for you. Great fear came upon, and now we're going to call them the church. Why? Because the fear that came upon them was a reverent awe and respect for the holiness of God. No longer are they simply identified as people that believe Jesus is alive. They are now being identified as people who have a great respect for the holiness of God. And so they are being called the gathering of God's people as a community who have fear for the holiness of God that also believe in Jesus as the Messiah. They haven't lost that, but something has been added to them as people recognize these are people who live differently because they have fear and respect and reverence for the holiness of God, except for two of them, apparently. And so let's make sure we haven't missed the issue at hand. 
It says Satan had filled Ananias and Sapphira's heart, and the Greek phrase there actually means that they were tempted with desires. Because if you read it that way in English, it looks like they could just say, well, the devil made us do it. He filled our hearts. It's not our fault. But actually, it's very much their fault that they're responsible for because the, the phrasing says they were simply tempted with desires and what had happened when all of the rest of the church had a reverent awe for holiness, they didn't. And they allowed stuff in their hearts to just stay in their hearts. And so actually what I think could help us today, if you'll allow a little conjecture, is let's hypothesize over what we think was in their hearts. Again, the end result was simply lying, but there was something in their hearts that led them to that point when Satan tempted them with desires. There were things in their hearts that said, oh yes, that's nice. I think I'll take that. So if we were just to think about what would be there to cause them to act this way, I think one of the first things we could say was in their heart is selfishness. And, and the reason I say that is because it was clear in this story. They wanted this for themselves. It says they kept back part of it for themselves. Everybody else was being generous, but they wanted to keep it for themselves. Here's what you need to know. In your heart, there are two opposing forces. One is generosity and one is selfishness. And you will never have a high level of selfishness and a high level of generosity. You can't have that. What has to happen is in order to have a high level of generosity, you have to have a low level of selfishness where you're not thinking about yourself, you're not putting yourself first, you're not putting your needs first, and you're definitely not putting your wants first, which is what they did. But as your selfishness goes up, your generosity goes down. And we see that in their heart, they simply wanted it for themselves, even though other people were actually going hungry. So we can also guess in their hearts would be greed. Greed is when you simply want material possessions and wealth without regard for need. It's, it's, it's just want. Like you've got enough and it doesn't matter. And the story is real clear. They kept it because they wanted it. They didn't use it to pay off debts. They didn't use it to upgrade their donkey to a camel. They didn't use it for any practical purpose or need. Nope. It says they wanted it for themselves. As a matter of fact, here's a really cool little detail of the story that gets missed. And that's why you, you, you get to come and, and hear a preacher preach these cool little things for you. And that is the Greek word used for keeping back is a very different and rare word used here. It's not used very often, and it actually means embezzle. Peter said, why have you embezzled? Now, Peter also was the one that said, it was yours to do what you wanted with it. Doesn't that sound contradictory? It does. For Peter to say, you could do whatever you wanted with this. Why, why are you doing this? But then Peter says, why have you embezzled it? What that tells us is that as the end of chapter four, it said that everybody was selling and bringing things and we, we skipped part of the story where a guy named Barnabas, he did the same thing. So what was happening is everybody was saying, we'll do this too, we'll do it too. And so he had promised to give this to the community. And at the point of making that pledge and that promise to provide for everybody, then it was expected to be given. He had given it away. But then when he didn't give it away, he was actually embezzling from a promise he had already made. It's really interesting to think about if you let greed stay in your heart. But something else I think we can see in their heart is that they wanted to impress others. I mean, everybody was trying to be generous. We already see they didn't have generosity in their hearts, but they wanted to look the part. Well, everybody is selling things and giving things, so we'll sell something and we'll look like we're giving it. And we'll just lie about the amount that's there because we want to impress all of the other people in the church. You know, that's a plague in the church today is where we want to impress each other instead of being honest about where we are. Walk into the building. Hey, how you doing today? Oh, I am just great. Do yeah. you know how many of us are not just great? Lying through our teeth with teeth. With teeth. <laughs> it's been quite a morning. That's not half the mistake I made in the last service. I'm going to leave it at that. The fourth thing that we see in their hearts is deception. Think about that. They made an intentional plan with time to plan ahead to present a false reality to all of the brothers and sisters in the church together, people whose children are going hungry because they don't have anything. And they had no problem holding their heads high, letting everybody believe something about them that wasn't true. There's something really dark in our hearts when we have no problem letting people around us who know us and care about us and will spend eternity with us believe something that's not true about us. Another thing we can see in their hearts is that they had no respect for authority. 
If we back up a few sentences, it says that people brought the proceeds, they laid them at the apostles' feet. And it even says Ananias did that. Ananias brought the proceeds and laid it at the apostles' feet. A lot of times when you read the story, since Peter's the only one talking, we think they were just lying to Peter. But apparently they were lying to all of the apostles, not, or at least many of them that would have been there that day. And it doesn't really matter. Peter should have counted as one of them anyway, right? Because here's the deal. The apostles, including Peter, were the ones who were chosen by Jesus. They were appointed. They were anointed. They were called for this very service. And think about something that they missed here. When a leader is called and appointed and the Holy Spirit is filling the people in the church, God may speak to leaders. And you hope God speaks to leaders because you want God to speak through leaders. Are you with me? Do you want to be here today just to hear me tell you good stories about what I think for your life? Or do you want me to share with you God's heart for your life? We want God to speak through our leaders, which means we expect God to speak to our leaders. The coolest part of this story, in my opinion, is that Peter knew from the Holy Spirit that Ananias was lying. Did you notice that there were, there were no facts involved, but Peter simply, as soon as he brought the money and he laid it down, Peter looked at him and said, why has Satan filled your heart to lie? Because he knew from the Holy Spirit. And they had no respect for godly authority in their lives, and they treated them just like everyone else, that they had no regard for lying and deceiving. But I think maybe the worst one is they had no fear of God. Think about that. They had no fear of God. They knew what they were doing was wrong. I mean, if you've ever read the Bible, maybe you've gotten into it. You're like, hey, I'll read the Bible for the first time. And you get somewhere about this far in and you go, man, I never knew that was in there. I've been doing that wrong. God, I'm sorry. This wasn't one of those things hidden deep in the Bible somewhere. This is the Ten Commandments. This is child's play. We teach this in our nursery. Don't lie. <laughs> Do not lie. I mean, come on. They had no excuse. One of the most basic things, when God says, look, let's just start with 10. 10 things that, that would offend my holiness. Don't lie. I mean, come on. And they didn't care that that was one of the most basic things to offend God's nature. And they clearly didn't fear that God might actually do something about it. So look, we'll just stop there with the conjecture of what's in their hearts because it's not our place to judge another's heart. But what I was trying to do is make this practical for us today to realize this is not just one little, oops, they kept money and lied. This is, there were things deep-seated in their heart that they never confronted, they never challenged, they never did anything about. And not only did it cost them their holiness and wreck the beauty of the church, it cost them their very lives. What you and I need to understand today is that none of us are perfectly holy. But we're still responsible for what's in our hearts. And we are still responsible for what we do because of what's in our hearts. And so the question that you and I need to answer today is what are we to do? What are we to do if we want to deal with the sinfulness of our hearts and yet be the church Jesus is building? What are we to do? Thanks for asking. <laughs> Proverbs 4.23 one of the first verses I ever learned and memorized, one of the first that you should memorize if you have not yet, and one of the first you should ever teach your children. Above all else, guard your heart. Above all else. You've got a security system with cameras on your house. You've got a little ring doorbell. You can sit at your office and watch who's on your porch. You guard your porch. You've got your car inside the garage with the door closed behind it because you guard the car. You, we, got, we got a whole thing called helicopter parents because we guard our children to such a degree. But do you guard your heart? Because the Bible says above all else, above your wallet, above your house, above anything else, guard this. Why? It told us. Because everything you do, every word you speak, every action, every response, every moment of your life for your entire life will be ruled by what's in your heart. Above all else, guard your heart. You've got to have the picture of like a soldier on guard duty at the gate of, a, of a, ba a military base. Their job is to make sure the only thing that comes in the gate is what is good for those inside. Nothing that would harm those inside, that would challenge the integrity or the safety of that military. Nothing can get in that is not good for it. That is a, a guard's entire job when they're on guard duty. And the Bible says you need to stand guard. Because we have two pictures. Did you notice the two pictures? One of them is when says Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. But then Peter says, 
Why have you let Satan fill your heart? You see, we've got to guard against who gets in and what they bring. We have to guard. We have to stand guard. Above all else, guard your heart. Now, if you know anything about me, since I used to teach school for so long, I, I like to just make this as practical and like middle school level if I can. And so I hope this will help you, not meant to insult you, but I'm gonna give you the three things you need to practically do in order, they are a progression, to guard your heart. Because the words guard your heart, although they're great, they leave you a little bit with like, eh, how do I do that? And so the first one is this, don't trust your heart. Don't trust your heart. Now I know there are some humans in here that just got a little offended when I said that. <laughs> How dare you, pastor? Well, all I'm gonna tell you is, according to the Bible, the heart is the governing agency of our life. As we just read, everything we do comes out of it. So whatever's in your heart will determine the course of your life. And matter of fact, in the Bible, you can interchange the word heart almost every time with the word soul. Why does that matter? Because the word soul is your mind, your will, your emotions. It is what you think, is what you want, and it's what you feel. So what the Bible is saying is above all else, guard what you think and what you want and what you feel because every action for your entire life is gonna come out of what you think and what you want and what you feel. The problem is the Bible tells us that what we think and what we want and what we feel is very, very troublesome. Jeremiah says the heart is deceitful above all things. The heart is deceitful above all things. It is desperately sick. Who can understand it? But you know what the message of our world is today? Follow your heart. Some of you have got the little picture on your office wall. Follow your heart. Some of you have got the t-shirt. Follow your heart. Go home and burn them. <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you why. If you'll allow me a little pastor commentary, if I can just have 30 seconds on the soapbox. As I look at the state of our world today, it is because there are so many that allow what's in their heart to be their highest authority and fulfilling what's in their heart to be their highest goal. I think our world would look very different if we didn't have people who allowed what they think and want and feel to be their highest form of truth and they didn't decide that what they think and want and feel, fulfilling that was their number one goal but that is the world you and I live in today. We're called to be different. The Bible tells us you can't trust your heart. And if we're not gonna trust our heart, then it leads us to the second, and that is to examine our hearts. If you know that your heart in its own humanity and its own sinfulness is deceitful above all else, then you've gotta examine what's in there. You've gotta examine why you just did that, why you just said that, why you just acted that way. The Bible tells us now the works of the flesh and that means our sin nature before Jesus. Our sin nature without Jesus is our flesh. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Things like sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these, meaning the list would keep going. That's not all that's there. But we have an old nature. Before we met Jesus, we're supposed to have a new nature. And so what we need to do is examine our hearts and see which nature is ruling. The question is, how often do you examine your heart? How often do you stop and go, hmm, why did I? Why did, how often do you find yourself there? Man, I think I'm offended at someone. I must have unforgiveness in my heart. I must be holding a grudge. How often do you find, if you take a second glance or look at something on the internet you shouldn't, do you realize, oh, you know what? That means there's lust in my heart, impurity in my heart. If you don't want to give, you go, there's greed or selfishness in my heart. How often do we take a look at what's in our heart? I'm gonna tell you, it's actually a very easy thing to examine. All you have to do is watch for how you respond to situations, how you treat people, and what you choose to do. How you respond to situations will tell you what's in your heart. How you treat people, and let me give you a caveat there, how you treat every person. Some of us are like, well, I treat most people just fine, but you know, there's that one or two, you know, they crossed me and man, they deserve, no, 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 no. How you treat any of God's created children, how you treat people, and then what do you choose to do? 
Is it what God said? Or is it something that you want? God will tell you what's in your heart. So look, here we are, right? We don't trust our hearts. So we examine our hearts. And if I stop there, man, that's a horrible place to be. That, that's just a mess. Nobody wants to stay right there. You don't trust your heart and you find out it's full of garbage. Oh no, what are we gonna do now? It leads us to the third one. Ask God to transform your heart. Transform is a very, in my opinion, harsh, active word about change. And I intentionally wanted to use an edgy word because this is not an easy process. Ask God to transform your heart. It's got to be different because you met Jesus. Who you were and the way you acted and the things you did and the things you thought and the things you chased and pursued before Jesus can't be the same stuff after Jesus. Your heart has to change. David in one of the most famous psalms in the Bible says, create in me a clean heart, oh God. I can't do it. But I need you to understand the significance of this passage and why David wrote this. This was at the moment, if you don't know the story, David was king of God's people. And at this moment when he was king, he wasn't doing what he should be doing because in his pride, he's like, I'm king. I get to live in a great palace. I'm not going out to war and, and I can have anything I want. And so as he was walking on the rooftop, he decided he wanted a beautiful woman that he saw bathing on top of her house. He wrote this when he discovered he had failed the first two steps of this. He trusted his heart. I'm king. I can have what I want. Pride. I want her. Lust. He didn't question his heart. He didn't examine his heart. He trusted it and he didn't examine it. So how did he get to this point? Because God sent a prophet named Nathan to reveal to him God is not pleased. God sees and God is not pleased. And when that happened, David, by the Spirit, oh my God, creating me, a, doing me what I can't do, creating me a clean heart. Because the one I have, I can't keep living with. The one I have, you see what it just led me to do. What's in me is so not like you, God. You, God, have to do something in here. I can't babysit this heart I can't manage this heart. You've got you to transform it. God even says that's his intention for his people. He says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And the brother of Jesus wrote it to us this way, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Are you offended that I called you double-minded? I didn't do it, James did. But anyway, back to the point. We are double-minded. Be honest about it. Here we are in church singing songs, God, I love you, Jesus, I wanna be more like you than tomorrow in traffic. How dare you cut me off? I'm gonna chase you down and show you my favorite finger. You know what I mean? Because we're double-minded. There's a part of us, I wanna be like God. There's a part of us, I wanna have what I want. We are double-minded. Acknowledge it. And that's why you ask God to transform it. Because there's a war going on inside of our hearts. And I love what James says. It's, it's our job to partner with the Holy Spirit. David acknowledges we can't do it on our own, but James reminds us you don't just get to sit back and blame God. Purify your hearts. Come to God. Draw near to him. Ask him to do something. I had a friend of mine, one of uh, just just cool guy here at Grace Life, came up to me right before the service, and he said, hey, two weeks, man. I want you to celebrate with me in two weeks. And I'm thinking, what? Your retirement party, your birthday, what? He said, I'm gonna be sober a thousand days. Think about that. I said, man, I'm so proud of you. He said, don't be proud of me. I said, I am proud of you because you partnered with the Holy Spirit. There are a lot of people that have been convicted for doing the things you used to do, but you did something about it. And he did came to this church about that long ago and got radically saved. I mean, different person saved. You see, we should be different in here because we've met Jesus. So I'm gonna leave you today with a challenge if the message hasn't been challenging enough. The challenge is, I think, huge. The church Jesus is building can only be full of one thing. And we saw two pictures. 
We saw where it said after they had prayed, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. But then we also saw the other picture where Peter says, why has Satan filled your heart? The church Jesus is building can only be filled with one thing. Either the devil and his fruit or the spirit and his fruit. The devil and his fruit, lust, greed, idolatry, anger, impurity, jealousy, enough of that garbage. But on the other hand, the Bible gives us a beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit and his fruit. Love, joy, peace. Are you thinking about us? Are you thinking about this? Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You see, the church Jesus is building will be full of whatever we're full of because we are the church. Amen? Let me pray for us. God, we thank you that your mercy is so incredible. Yes, we, we have a sin nature that has tried to rule our, our world and dominate it, and it did before we met you. And, and it's a fight in our hearts every day of our lives. But your mercy is so good that you allow us to keep coming back to you and saying, God, I'm sorry. So today, right now, God, we come to you and say, we're sorry for the things that have been in our hearts that have ruled and reigned unconfronted and unchallenged. But we ask you, God, just as David did, will you come and do what only you can do? Will you create in me a clean heart? Will you create in me a clean heart that looks more like you? If you just stay in a place of prayer, I want to speak to those who have yet to make Jesus their king. Again, really the whole theme of this message is that the human heart, well, it's sick and it's sinful and it doesn't look like God. As a result of that, every single one of us at some point has done something that has offended God, separated us from him. The Bible calls it sin. The good news is that God loves you so much he didn't want to leave you separated from him or having to pay for your own sins. That's why he sent Jesus. Jesus is his son, God in the flesh who lived a perfect life upon the earth so that when he was crucified as an innocent man on the cross, as his blood was shed and his body was broken, it can then pay the penalty for our sins, yours and mine, because he had none of his own. It gives us forgiveness, and then by the same power that raised him from the dead, he offers us eternal life. We call this the free gift of salvation. But just like any other gift, it's a gift you have to receive. And if you never have, if you've never exchanged the life you've been living for the one that Jesus died to give you, I want to help you do that right now, wherever you are. Would you simply pray and say something like this to yourself and to God? Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died for me. And so now I choose to live for you. I thank you that you love me. I thank you that I'm forgiven. In my simple prayer here today, would you fill me with your spirit and give me a life of great meaning in your kingdom? Amen. Would you all help me celebrate with them, everybody? <laughs>